So friends, uh, we are discussing uh, speculative theories of population and last time we discussed Malthusian theory of population. Uh, if you remember according to Malthus, uh, there is a natural law for plants, animals, human beings according to which uh, population can grow in geometric fashion and double in every 25 year cycle while means of production in best possible circumstances can grow only in arithmetic progression. So, eventually uh, when population grows like 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 and food as 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this gives rise to imbalance. This imbalance between population and food cannot continue for long. So, there are checks and it talks of two types of checks positive checks and preventive checks. All those checks on population which are exercised through raising the death rate, they may be man made, they may be uh, nature made. Man made means wars, uh, conflicts, suicides, homicides, uh, child exposure, female infanticide, uh, and nature made means epidemics or natural catastrophe. Uh, they are positive checks. And checks through uh, reducing birth rate such as family planning, raising age of marriage or uh, prostitution, homosexuality, these are all uh, preventive type of checks which may further be classified into vice and misery. Uh, Malthus wanted to say that humans can never be happy uh, because happiness according to him lies in uh, healthy, loving and sexual relationships between adults uninterrupted by any kind of contraception or anything. But uh, uh, if this happens then there are long term bad consequences and uh, imbalance of population leading to wars or, or all, all those factors which can raise the death rate of population. Now, uh, this theory of population by Malthus was most criticized by Karl Marx. And today we are going to discuss about Marx's theory of population. Uh, I thought that uh, while discussing Marx's theory of population, I must say uh, what Marx's theory is, uh, uh, what are various types of surplus populations, what are the causes of surplus population. And then to understand Marx's theory of population, maybe we have to go a bit beyond Marx's theory of population. and. Uh, uh, take up the concept of uh, conflict or dialectical materialism or I mean uh, in the broader framework of Marx's theory of society we have to see. It. So, uh, I, uh, why was Marx critical of Marx uh, Malthusian theory? Marx was very critical of Malthus and uh, he said that an abstract law of population did not exist for men the kind of abject, abstract law that Malthus was talking about may have existed for plants and animals, but such a law does not exist for humans. All uh, historical modes of production have their own special laws of population which are valid only within their limits. You know this course on population is a new course for you, but uh, as a student of sociology you have already done. Uh, uh, a theory course and in theory you have dealt with Marx's theory of society. Now, what Marx uh, wants to say that as society progresses, uh, uh, initially society was in the stage of classlessness, uh, primitive society he called it primitive classless society. From primitive classless society came class societies, master slave, feudal, then bourgeois or capitalist society. And then it, uh, he uh, suggested that due to its own internal contradictions, bourgeois or capitalist society would be replaced by some kind of socialist society. And then uh, socialist society will pave the way for communist society. <coughs> now, according to Marx, 
uh, what kind of law of population exists depends on uh, in which stage of development a society is. And he would also like to distinguish between different theories of population like theory of birth rate, theory of death rate, theory of migration rate and a theory of migration which is valid for uh, ancient society or primitive society is not valid for feudal society. Uh, the rate of migration, the reasons behind migration, the impact of migration on social structure, what is valid for feudal society is not valid for bourgeois society. The laws of migration for feudal and bourgeois societies are different and the same laws would not exist in future socialist or capitalist society. Likewise, uh, laws of birth rate or death rate. So, um, laws of population are valid only within their limits. These limits are set by development uh, of the mode of production or stages of production. So, for different types of stages of production or mode of production, you have different types of laws and uh, you cannot say that uh, there is any natural law which will apply to all types of human societies irrespective of uh, the stage of development. As you know that uh, for Karl Marx, uh, uh, there is a two class model of capitalist society. Interestingly, although uh, in uh, developing his theory of uh, communism, uh, he talks about various types of stages of development, but ultimately the analysis that Marx has made in his lifetime. Uh, based on empirical facts, statistical data, economic data uh, is all confined to analysis of capitalist society. It is only in giving the framework uh, to e explore issues pertaining to social change that he, he talks about dialectical materialism or, uh, or, or st stages of development, but the analysis that he makes is the analysis of capitalist society. He does not analyze socialist society, he does not analyze, he does not write much about communist society. We do not get a blueprint of communist society from writings of Karl Marx except uh, some uh, broad statements of purpose. Uh, this uh, uh, theory of population uh, in original form I read in uh, chapter 25 of Capital uh, and uh, the title of the chapter is the general law of capitalist accumulation. I am referring to three volumes of works of Marx published in the form of uh, this book Capital by Progress Publications. In addition, apart from these Progress uh, publications of three volumes of Capital, there are uh, two other books by the same publishers, uh, Progress Publishers, a book uh, an out outline theory of population and another book with the title The Theory of Population. Both these books are edited by Valenti and published by Progress Publishers and if you combine uh, these three things, chapter 25 of Capital uh, and uh, these two books, uh, outline theory of population and theory of population, uh, then you can understand the Marxist theory of population well. And to understand Marxist theory of population, it is important to understand the concept of surplus labor. According to Marx, a capitalist society consists of two basic classes, capitalists who own means of production and workers who own nothing except their labor power. So, in capitalist society, a capitalist society is a class society, uh, although uh, there are so many other classes also. Mars himself, uh, it is interesting to uh, see that uh, Mars, uh, who is always analyzing society in the framework of class, understood the difficulty of uh, conceptualizing or defining class, uh, sorry, uh, of conceptualizing or defining class and therefore, he systematically postponed discussion of class. And it was in the last chapter of the capital, when he started writing on class systematically, he could write only one and a half pages and he died. So, uh, the concept of class which is so vital to Marx's theory remains incomplete by Karl Marx. Uh, 
and it was later a German sociology Dahrendorf uh, whose theory of stratification in terms of uh, authority relations you have read in, uh, in a course on social stratification who actually completed the chapter on class. Uh, Dahrendorf claimed that this is how uh, Marx would have completed that chapter on class in, in the book Capital. Uh, and while writing that chapter by taking uh, phrases and quotations and statements from earlier portions of Capital and from other writings of Karl Marx, he developed a critical attitude towards Marx's theory. And as you know that uh, later he became uh, a critic of Marx's theory of stratification and developed his own theory. So, uh, in that uh, last chapter on class, Karl Marx himself defines a number of classes. But uh, in Marx's theory, we talk of two classes in the sense that the most basic of all the classes which play a revolutionary role in transformation of society from capitalist mode of production to socialist mode of production are only these two, capitalists and workers. To Marx in a capitalist society, production is controlled by the capitalist class. They earn from profit. They hire workers and supply them the wherewithal of work means instruments of production and raw material. So, uh, production needs three things, um, instruments of production, raw material and workers. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, the instruments of production on their own cannot produce anything. Similarly, raw material uh, itself cannot produce anything. It is only when workers work on instruments of production and raw material that a value is added to them. So, according to labor theory of value, it is only workers who create value addition through their labor. That is work done by the laborers only creates value and the means of production on their own cannot produce anything. That is why Marx's theory of value is also called the labor theory of value. So, the workers are however given uh, wages which are always less than their contribution. The difference or surplus is expropriated by them by capitalists and added to fixed capital under their possession. Uh, since this is uh, uh, the most vital concept in understanding surplus and class relations, uh, I would like to explain this by going to board. Uh, to put it in other words, capital consists of two parts, constant capital and variable capital. You know, capital fixed capital plus variable capital. This uh, fixed capital refers to in a simple language say money value of all uh, equipment, technology, raw material, land, building, everything that is needed in the process of production other than the labor power. And the term variable capital refers to uh, some total of wages which are given to workers when they are hired for production. Fixed capital alone cannot produce anything. So, if there is no worker to work in the industry, then building alone or machines alone or uh, raw material alone cannot do anything. Uh, so, the, it is this uh, workers or variable capital or uh, for which workers are given wages, when they are combined with fixed capital, then only there is some addition to capital. And why is there addition to capital? Because according to Karl Marx, let us say uh, a worker is hired, uh, uh, this is illustrative and I am not using exactly the terms used by Karl Marx. Uh, but for explaining his uh, concept of surplus labor, let me tell you sir, suppose a worker is hired for x hours of work. Okay. This may be 10 hours, this may be 12 hours, this may be 8 hours. According to tradition, conventions, laws of society, a worker is hired for x hours of work. Now, in uh, x minus t hours, uh, if you broadly divide this total uh, length of working hour into x minus t and t, 
there is some p such that uh, in x minus t hours the worker is contributing to production process which is equivalent to the wages given to him. See you hire a worker for 8 hours, then in actually 4 hours only or 5 hours or 6 hours uh, time less than the time for which he is hired. Uh, he is able to contribute to production process by an amount which is equivalent to wages that are given to him, but he is actually working for x hours. So, in the remaining t hours whatever he co contributes uh, that is added to capital that is surplus. This is the meaning of surplus and this surplus where does this surplus go? This surplus is appropriated by the capitalist class. So, at the end of a production cycle your capital has increased. Now, fixed capital remains same, hmm? uh, it does not do anything. Variable capital produces two things or variable capital works for the capitalist class. In x minus t hour a worker is working uh, uh, to justify his wages and in the remaining t hours he is working extra. So, imagine that if n number of workers are working, then n multiplied by the contribution in this t hour that is the addition to capital. So, at the end of the production cycle you find that uh, the total capital has increased. Now, this uh, increase in total capital does not mean proportional or uh, same uh, proportion of increase in both fixed capital and variable capital. You find that as uh, uh, capital accumulation takes place, proportion of fixed capital, proportion of fixed capital increases, proportion of fixed capital increases and uh, proportion of variable capital decreases. Uh, to use Mars systems, when there is uh, a quantitative change in capital, capital is expanding. So, when there is a cap, uh, quantitative change in the capital, there is also a qualitative change and that qualitative change occurs uh, in terms of proportion that goes to fixed capital and the proportion that goes to variable capital. You know, I, I, I was remembering this somewhere uh, in 11 5 year plan, uh, government of India writes that in our industry proportion of variable capital is decreasing, which means uh, that uh, assets, raw material, value of raw material, buildings, technology, equipment. Uh, has gone up and the proportion of capital which is going to workers in the form of wages is declining and condition of working class ultimately depends on this. So, uh, in this slide you can see this uh, that capital consists of two parts constant capital and work variable capital. The part of the capital which is represented by the means of production raw and auxiliary material and instruments of labor is the constant capital. The part of the capital represented by labor power is the variable capital, while the constant capital does not undergo any change of the quantitative value, the variable capital produces its own value plus a surplus. Now, accumulation of capital though originally appearing as its quantitative extension only results eventually in the change in the composition, this is qualitative change. Under a constant increase of its const constant constituent and a constant decline in variable constituent. On several occasions when the total capital increases, its variable part may also increase. So, there may be times in capitalist society, sometimes there may be times uh, when the ob so, uh, so objective condition or wages of the working class are also rising. 
but that is a temporary phenomenon. So, when capital increases sometimes variable capital may also increase and uh, the capitalists may share more of their capital with the workers, raise their wages, minimum wages, parks, benefits, spend more on their education and health, uh, but it will always increase in a constantly diminishing proportion. So, although in absolute terms sometime variable capital may also rise and uh, the money spent on welfare of workers and wages may rise uh, in absolute terms, but the proportion of variable capital in total capital is always declining or at least that is the long term tendency of composition of capital. Technological development rise in productivity of labor and centralization tend to decrease the ratio of variable capital further. So, with uh, more advanced more modernization more technological development improvement in labor productivity uh, this variable comp capital component of the total capital uh, decreases at faster rate. Since in a capitalist society the demand for labor depends on the variable constituent only it falls progressively and the laboring population therefore, produces along with the accumulation of capital the means by which it is, uh, it is rendered superfluous and surplus to an increasing extent. So, uh, uh, with law of, uh, with accumulation of capital in capitalist society uh, when workers are producing more contributing more to capital they are also creating conditions in which they will become superfluous and surplus. Accordingly, the advancement of modern industry leads to unemployment and underemployment. For Marx therefore, the correlation between accumulation of capital and rate of wages is nothing else than the correlation between the unpaid labor transformed into capital and the additional paid labor necessary for the setting in motion of this additional capital. Actually, when uh, somebody like Malthus says that uh, uh, growth of population will have uh, definitely adverse consequences on uh, uh, welfare, he is treating as though population and development are two independent variables. According to Karl Marx, they are not independent. Development uh, is symbolized by this part and uh, uh, condition of workers uh, are symbolized by this part variable capital and the, uh, the relationship between the two is the relationship between uh, that part of uh, uh, workers contribution which is not paid and that part which is paid for. So, it is a relationship between workers contribution only labors contribution only uh, uh, unpaid part and paid part. It is not to be seen as relation between two independent factors of population and capital. It must be seen as the relation between the unpaid labor and the paid labor of the same laboring population. So, development is all about the uh, labor contribution. Uh, it is all labor contribution and today's fixed capital is also nothing but uh, yesteryear's unpaid capital uh, expropriated by a class of capitalists and converted into fixed capital. So, all that we have all the technological advancement today we have in the form of say money, shares, computers, you know the air conditioned room whatever technological advancement we see today that is all the result of uh, surplus and, and expropriation of surplus converted in the into the form of fixed capital. Otherwise, this is all uh, the contribution of workers only. But, uh, you can also see that the contribution of workers uh, is today in capitalist society uh, making the working population surplus and redundant. It must be seen as uh, so the relationship uh, must uh, uh, must be seen as that between the unpaid labor fixed capital is unpaid labor and uh, uh, variable capital of wages that is the paid labor. Um, Marx showed that the existence of what has been considered as surplus population is a necessary product of accumulation of wealth on a capitalist basis. So, according to Malthus there is a natural law according to which population keeps on increasing and wherever there is more development 
population will rise faster and that is the cause of surplus population. But according to Mars, uh, it is the workers contribution to development which has only made the workers surplus or unemployed or uh, uh, redundant. Uh, it is also a lever of capitalist development. If the quantity of unpaid labor supplied by the working class and accumulated by the capitalist class increases so rapidly that its conversion into capital requires an extraordinary addition of paid labor, then wages rise and all other circumstances remaining equal, the unpaid labor diminishes in proportion. But as soon as this uh, diminution touches the point at which the surplus labor that nourishes capital is no longer supplied in normal quantity, a reaction sets in, a smaller part of revenue is capitalized, accumulation lags and the movement of rise in wages receives a check. To explain this Mars would use a simile, as in religion man is governed by the products of his own brain, so in capitalist production he is governed by the products of his own hand. You know, uh, very powerful statement which can create controversy uh, in this very class itself. You know, according to Mars, religion is all a product of man's own brain. You know, all uh, books, uh, all theocracies, everything has been uh, produced by man. Yeah? Uh, there is nothing like divine. Um, and if I ask you, do you think that uh, the religious ideas are ideas produced by man? If I do not give any other background, I just ask you, uh, do you think that religious ideas are ideas produced by man? Now, all of you will agree, yes, yes. But when I say that, uh, uh, will you say that uh, Vedas are also produced by man, then maybe it will hurt Hindu sensibilities, many Hindus will be offended. Then if I tell that, achha, if all ideas are produced by man, do you think that the ideas written in the Holy Quran are also produced by man, then for Muslim students can be quite offensive. Similarly, for Guru Granth Sahib or for Bible, now Mars says that uh, all uh, as in religion. Now, what has man done? Man has produced religion, but man has become victim of religion. Today, you see around so much of conflict, communal tension, riots, um, and um, so much of uh, uh, misery in the name of religion, fights, uh, and also so much of restraint on life. So much of some uh, that kind of discipline, sometimes absurd, irrational, the discipline and the torch, sometimes people uh, torture themselves in the name of religion. Hmm? Uh, long fasting, in some religion uh, there is a virtue of uh, long fast. Uh, there are religions we say that if you fast so long for 10 days, 15 days, 2 months, 3 months, that ultimately you die of fast, then your soul is liberated. So, this is what religion has done. Now, religion which is a product of man only is killing man today. Likewise, in capitalist society, the fixed capital which or the technology or the advancement, uh, prosperity uh, or machine tools which are product of uh, labor only, they are today, uh, Karl Marx used the term Mr. Capital for that. Today, Mr. Capital is telling the worker that we do not need you, you are surplus, you are more than you are needed. So, uh, in banks, the computerization of banks will say we do not require so many workers. Yes, sir. Here I have a doubt, <laughs> you know, no, sir, his argument is that all the unpaid wages yes. of labor, so the yes. workers are accumulated by the capitalists yes. in the form of this uh, fixed capital, fixed capital. Uh, that is technology advancement. Uh, actually, it is a, this argument against development, actually if you follow the no, how? Yeah, I don't. I think he's living in. Uh, he lived in 18, uh, 19th century. See, uh, it it means that he's against te development, technology, this kind of the stuff. But that is, suppose if a country is uh, developed, or suppose if I'm a uh, capital, I'm a businessman. If I have something, this kind of development, it means that I'm utilizing or what is exploiting the worker. This kind of argument, I think. I don't know. If you know, uh, I, yes, I understand your answer. Actually, what Karl Marx is saying, this is true that if nobody ever exploited workers, mm. imagine a situation in history, 
in which a worker was, was never exploited, then it means there will be no fixed capital. If a worker is never exploited, means th there is no class of people in a classless society. Amount of expropriation of surplus would be necessary. Otherwise, there would be no fixed capital, no development. But uh, what is of interest to Marx is that this uh, surplus can be put to use of all or of the profit or benefit of the capitalist class only. Actually, uh, uh, according to Karl Marx, that is why uh, Marx says that bourgeoisie played a revolutionary role in society. At one time from feudal to capitalist mode of production, bourgeoisie played a revolutionary role. If bourgeoisie did not exist or did not exploit the workers, then so much of modernization or economic development would not occur. What Marx is saying that tomorrow in the socialist society, uh, the surplus, whatever surplus will be created will uh, be used for the benefit of all the classes. There will be no class, uh, there will be some government which on the behalf of the whole society uh, 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 will use the labor power and whatever surplus is generated, that surplus uh, will be used for the benefit of the whole mankind. It is not that uh, only capitalist class will grow or owners of means of production will become richer and richer and the condition of working class becomes pathetic, more and more pathetic or they, they become pauperized, dependent, alienated and the gap between the rich and the poor uh, keeps on widening. Mars is against that. But yes, you are right that if there is, if there, uh, if there is no surplus, if uh, it is like uh, all the income that we generate in a, uh, uh, in an economy in some year, if the total income is consumed means that he is against or, uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, he is in favor of entrepreneurship, but that entrepreneurship will exist on behalf of society. There will be no private ownership. Uh, this is true that whatever our gross domestic product is, if we consume the whole of that and there can be uh, very good reasons to consume whole of that. In our country in which 28 percent of population is living below the poverty, somebody can say there is no point in saving and investing. First satisfy the consumer needs of all the people, but then it will also mean that our uh, income level will remain same and due to rise in population per capita income will decline. Uh, Karl Marx is not uh, uh, imagining that kind of situation in which there will be no surplus, but he is saying that uh, once the means of production are collectivized then uh, there will be no particular class, a small number of owners of means of production who will be exploiting others. Some amount from the uh, labor power will be saved for the development of the whole society. That is what equality will mean. So, with progressive advancement of capital, laborers are set free more rapidly than the reduction in the variable part of capital as compared with the constant because it enables the capitalist to exploit the labor power. It also leads to progressive replacement of superior labor power by inferior labor power. Uh, routine uh, kind of things for which you do not require skilled labor power can be given to unskilled people, can be given to children, can be given to old people, can be given to women without much skills. And so, as development takes place, uh, this is another reason why uh, the adult uh, workers uh, or the labor power will face problems. Ultimately, the overwork of labor, reduction in the variable constituent of capital and greater exploitation expand the ranks of industrial reserve army, means number of unemployed people and force the workers to subjugate under the dictates of capital independently of the natural increase of population. The development in this way increases both the demand and supply of labor by setting them free. So, uh, Marx is saying that because of this, uh, the phrase in the capital is the iron law of capitalist accumulation. So, under iron law of capitalist accumulation, there will be growth of capital, but that growth of capital uh, will be bad 
for uh, the condition of the working classes. That will be good only for the condition of uh, or for the profit or condition of the owners of means of production, but that will not raise the overall standards of workers and you will find unemployment. Uh, this unemployment, so unemployment is another term for surplus labor. Now, there are four types of unemployed people or four types of surplus population, floating surplus, latent surplus, stagnant surplus and paupers. You know, uh, uh, if you apply this Marxist theory uh, of development to Indian society, it can very well explain that on the one hand our society is growing, you know, initially at 1 percent rate, then uh, uh, the rate of growth of income increase further, 11th 5 year plan notice that 10th 5 year plan especially the last 4 years of 10th 5 year plan produce the maximum rate of growth of income. Uh, uh, and at the same time you find that the inequality between states, inequality between uh, 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 different social groups, inequality between urban and rural areas that is also widening. So, the condition of uh, workers and especially the conditions of scheduled tribes and in certain backward regions of the country has become worse in several senses. The plan itself says that condition of women deteriorated due to structural processes of development. So, the development uh, of the country and backwardness of the working classes, at least certain sections of working classes are existing side by side. Now, the floating surplus latent, these are the forms of surplus. Any member of the working class who is unemployed or partially employed belongs to this pool. In modern industries where modern division of labor exists, only a small number of workers continue to find employment in them while the majority of them are regularly discharged. The other day I was telling that uh, for many of you it may be a shocking information, but the total proportion of workers in Indian economy uh, which is in organized sector and having irregular employment is only 8 percent. What kind of development is taking place? And a large number of people which in census are recorded as marginal workers uh, and a large number of people working as self employed or in unorganized sector or as contextual labor in organized sector, they all are part of the surplus labor. Now, th there is surplus labor in urban areas, there is surplus labor in rural areas, or a surplus in urban areas which is uh, uh, related to industrialization and uh, in industry due to constant hiring and firing of workers that kind of surplus is called uh, this floating surplus. People keep on moving from one place to another, from one occupation to another, they keep on trying their luck. And uh, interestingly then in centers of industry, uh, on the one hand there will be so much of unemployment and on the other hand uh, there is always a complaint of shortage of good quality workers. Now, in India also, the, in, in every sector, in civil services, in academics, in banking, everywhere we say that we are not getting good quality uh, of people and at the same time there is so much of unemployment. In this kind of contradiction more confined to urban areas and industry and for this kind of thing. So, this, uh, uh, this type of surplus or unemployed population in industry so for this Mars has a definite name, this is the floating surplus because they keep on floating from one occupation to another, one industry to another. Then uh, there is latent surplus which is associated with agriculture sector. Capitalist development of agriculture uh, causes a latent surplus in the countryside. It is latent, it is hidden, latent means it is hidden and only when there are opportunities in neighboring urban areas or, or when new centers of industry or, or manufacturing or service come up, then immediately you find that lot of people are migrating from rural to urban areas. They, they are the latent surplus in agriculture sector. Then there is stagnant surplus which is part of the labor with extremely irregular employment. As some branches of industries decay, handicraft leads to manufacturing and manufacturing to mechanization, it provides a large reservoir of stagnant surplus to capital. 
consisting of laborers with extremely irregular employment, low wages and longer working hours. This is a stagnant surplus. One example of this type of surplus is in domestic industry. Lastly, pauperism consisting of the lowest sediment of the surplus population consists of the so called dangerous classes of vagabonds, criminals, prostitutes and they consist of those uh, who are able to work but have become pauper due to economic crisis, recession or these things can be included here, orphans and pauper children that demoralize and ragged and those unable to work. The last category of people includes those who lack power to adapt due to prevailing division of labor, who have crossed the normal age of work uh, and the victims of industry, the mutilated, the sickly and the widows. So, to Mars, pauperism is the hospital, very strong words, the hospital of the active labor army and the dead weight of the industrial reserve army. On development and employment, Mars says uh, that the law, and this is a quote from Mars uh, to quote, the law by which a constantly increasing quantity of means of production, thanks to the advancement in the productiveness of social labor, may be set in movement by a progressively diminishing expenditure of human power. This law in a capitalist society, where the laborer does not employ the means of production, but the means of production employ the laborer undergoes a complete inversion and express thus the higher the productiveness of labor, the greater is the pressure of the laborers on the means of employment. The more precarious therefore becomes their condition of existence, which the sale of their uh, own labor power for increasing another's wealth for the self expansion of capital. The fact that the means of production and the productiveness of labor increase, uh, increase more rapidly than the productive population expresses itself therefore, capitalistically in the inverse form that the laboring population always increases more rapidly than the conditions under which capital can employ this increase for its own self expansion. Now, if you read original writings of uh, Mars, then uh, Mars says that commenting on Malthusian theory of population that Malthus does not have anything to say afresh, it is all plagiarism uh, copied from here and there and whatever sensation he just say cause that was only because it served the interest of bourgeoisie, otherwise uh, there is nothing in Malthusian theory of population. I think uh, this is what in a sense Marx's theory of population is, I can uh, spend some more time on this or let me finish one or two slides and then uh, maybe uh, you can ask some questions. Uh, while for Malthus, the fundamental cause of poverty, unemployment, high mortality, malnutrition and destitution is the tendency of population to grow beyond the means of subsistence. For Marx, the cause of these factors is the capitalist mode of production, that is the big difference. Uh, for Malthus, there is a natural law of population because of which today you have poverty and destitution. Uh, for Mars, it is this iron law of capitalist accumulation. From the Marxist perspective, the changes in population dynamics are governed by the social systems that are created on the basis of relations of production. The solution to the problems of underdevelopment from this perspective lies basically in the socialist reconstruction of present day capitalist society. Without socialist <coughs> reconstruction of present day capitalist society, you cannot solve the problems of unemployment. This is Marx thought. And when population is analyzed from historical perspective, it is taken as a socio-economic category. Marx was of the view that population is an abstract notion if the classes uh, of which it consists are disregarded. These classes are also empty sound if relations of production in general and wage, labor and capital, three elements in production are not explicitly considered. Now, when we look at the Marxist theory, one may say that the Marxist theory is based on the idea of history of class struggle. Those who do not believe in Marxist theory of change would also not accept his theory of population. Moreover, the population reality of today is very complex and in many important respects differs from 
what was the situation in the times of Malthus and Mars. The, uh, the two lived in an age in which both birth and death rates were high. Death rates had only begun to fall in the industrially advanced countries and the rate of population growth was very low. National policies of today are pragmatic and responsive to new realities um, where death rates have fallen, birth rates are high or moderate and population is growing fast. Uh, in the second part of the 20th century, especially in the context of developing countries, Malthus's ideas influenced the planners and social scientists a great deal. They explored the negative linkage between population and human welfare. Uh, and among them, Hardin is uh, a professor of human ecology at the University of Ca California. He has very strong views on the matter. Uh, and then Paul Eldridge, uh, the author of Population Bomb, you know, they have something very significant to say. Um, Hardin must be seen as more Malthusian than Malthus was. To Hardin, poverty and epidemics are nature's way of maintaining demographic equilibrium. Hardin was against the developed countries giving any relief to developing countries at the time of earthquakes or, uh, or famine. Uh, he says that you know, the problem is uh, that suppose there is, he talks about Ethiopia and suppose there is some country facing high mortality or starvation death because of uh, epidemics or because of uh, <coughs> doubt uh, by giving them food grains uh, or money you think that you are helping them but you forget uh, this is hard in hard in, <laughs> i am not saying this, hard in is saying that you forget that to, actually in their socioeconomic milieu only a small size of population could survive because they have gone beyond that size so, they are facing the problem of floods and famines and they are dying. You stop their deaths by giving them money or food grains. What will be the result? Their population will explode for them. And when the means of, means of subsistence for them in their natural surroundings, in their natural environment, in their socio-economic cultural condition, uh, only a small number of people could survive and you are giving them aid so that more people survive. And they, in the meantime, they have produced more children and uh, the size of population has grown up. So, what will happen? Tomorrow again there will be epidemic and tomorrow again there will be floods and famines and starvation and many more people will die. That means, uh, all those who are admired for saving say 5000 lives in some country today are responsible for uh, uh, 50,000 deaths tomorrow. So, Hardin was saying that if people of less developed countries are dying, let them die. You are not helping them. You are saving 5,000 people today. You are not realizing that by saving 5,000 people today, you are creating a condition in which 50,000 people are likely to die tomorrow. What he said to some extent that makes sense also that uh, if you help some other country in starvation or epidemics or uh, shortage of food grains, you can also put a condition that they will go for family planning program. Both the things, uh, welfare and unlimited growth of population cannot go together. This is what Hardin said. It is very interesting to read Hardin, though he has so, uh, very strong views on aid and migration. He says either uh, you let them die or if you give them aid, you also tell, you, are, you also convince them that they must limit their uh, population size, not only birth rate, but population size. You know, uh, they, uh, a country which reduces its birth rate does not necessarily limit its, fa uh, its population size. Uh, decline in birth rates do not immediately result in a stoppage of growth of population, that takes time. Uh, uh, reduction in total fertility rate today will result in decline in birth rate only after 10 or 15 years, uh, because birth rate depends on age distribution of population also. Hardin says that there must be program for population, not for 
not only family planning program, you must have population programs in which uh, you tell your, uh, uh, your countries where you are helping that they must limit their population size. So, uh, by preventing deaths without putting a condition that the developing countries should control their population size, the developed countries are creating a situation in which a much larger number of people would die in the developing countries in the future. Is this kind of help virtuous <laughs> or sinful? And uh, those acting altruistically today will be responsible for greater misery in those countries in the future. If they do not uh, reduce their birth rate, if they continue to expand their population despite epidemics, despite uh, droughts and floods and famine. According to Hardin, in place of shortages of supply in the developing countries, attention should be shifted to long age of population. He made uh, a new, not, he did not coin it, but uh, for all practical purposes in population literature, he only gave the concept of long age of population. Nobody was using this term long age. He said that in, in place of saying that they have shortage of supply, you say that you have long age of population. And if the world is to be treated like a spaceship, then it has to have a powerful captain and in absence of this, the different countries should be seen as live boats, some of which are overcrowded. Commons, then idea of commons and what should developed countries do and so on. Uh, to him, the combination of welfare and freedom is the root cause of what he calls the runaway growth. To prevent this, either social welfare considerations have to go or laissez-faire birth control means freedom to breed will have to be restrained. It is not possible to maximize two things simultaneously, population size and welfare. There is a need for mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon by the majority of people. So, these are some, uh, then there is the idea of population bomb in 1968. Paul Aldrich wrote his book, uh, The Population Bomb and he said that in less developed countries, a kind of bomb is exploding, population bomb, whose consequences are much more pathetic, much more painful than uh, the consequences of uh, atom bomb. And uh, uh, um, he also said that uh, not only population growth, uh, for total impact on environment, there are three things. Population, population is one thing, then income and uh, 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 the environmental impact based on per unit of income. So, there are three things, uh, population growth, development and uh, uh, environmental impact. There are three things uh, which are affecting the total quality of environment and we have to made, make a conscious attempt to control uh, environmental degradation or total uh, impact on environment or nature uh, separately at these three levels. So, uh, actually when 50s and 60s population started exploding in less developed country, then ideas of Mars became less powerful. But uh, in, uh, in some countries like China, Mao uh, and in writings of Lenin and Stalin, you find uh, a very strong support of uh, Marxist theory. Ultimately, today the experience shows that all countries are going by practical considerations. So, Marxist like China, China has gone for one child policy. In a way, China uh, acknowledges the importance of writings of Malthus or Hardin or Paul Elric uh, when it uh, goes for one child policy. In USSR also, there was a uh, USSR problem was more uh, complex. In uh, European part of USSR, population was almost stabilized. In Asian part, or in Muslim part of USSR, there was rapid growth of population. So, in uh, as why Soviet Russia, finally, they went for what they call regionally differentiated population policy, something which, uh, which is not in um, congruence with Marx's theory of society or Lenin, Stalin's theory of population. Uh, they recognize that there are regional differences. So, ultimately, all theories of population have, have become more practical. Uh, they are neither following Malthus purely nor Mars. I think uh, although I have lot more slides, but I would like to uh, see uh, 
whether I am communicating what I wanted to communicate. Maybe you can ask one or two questions or if you need some clarification. So, you say that Karl Marx is very much critical of this person that is Madhus. That according to Marx, there is no natural law of population applicable to all the society. But then according to Marx, the solution is that the restructuring of the society or the socialist society. Then he says that there is a very Population growth and development is very much related, so if we solve that problem, we can also solve it. Yes. But the, at the same time, uh, Malthus says that, okay, uh, he is a, unless and until there is a vice or a check that is preventive or positive check, um, the population will be in, uh, increase, population growth will be in, I think, geomet uh, geometrical ratio or something. But uh, after analyzing, I don't know, uh, analyzing this, uh, Max uh, viewpoint or argument of population growth, but we know that there is no direct. Uh, he, he didn't mention any direct solution or what is called suggestion how to tackle. He correlated the population growth and uh, development with the structure of the society. That is uh, this kind of class or this uh, bourgeoisie. That, that because of the bourgeoisie, they are accumulating the unpaid labor. But uh, unlike uh, uh, Malthus, Malthus suggests some kind of solution or something. Uh, there is no. Some vague, vague, in my answer, vague, some, not, not giving any direct solution or suggestion how to tackle. He correlated it to the development or class structure or, or class struggle or. Yeah, according to Malthus, it is natural that whenever development will occur, population growth will also occur. And if population uh, growth is not restrained, then population can grow faster than development and that means that the development will be followed by some kind of underdevelopment or poverty. It is necessary to control the size of population for development to sustain. But according to Karl Marx, uh, uh, the cause of poverty is not the excessive growth of population because population is not an independent variable. Uh, uh, why do you say that population uh, is more than it should have been? Because you see misery, unemployment, high infant mortality, high maternal mortality around you, poverty, unemployment. And when you analyze the causes of these factors, then uh, you find that the causes of these are not uh, the excessive growth of population, but the faulty relations of production inequality, inequality in distribution of wealth, inequality with respect to ownership of means of production, uh, concentration of wealth and power at one place uh, uh, and therefore, uh, you cannot solve the problem of uh, working classes or problem of mankind or poverty or unemployment and these things simply by going for family planning or by restricting size of population. It is possible that the size of population is less uh, and even then there is misery. There are many countries where density of population is low and they are also facing the problem of unemployment, poverty, misery, high infant mortality and the problem is actually more of the faulty mode of production or unequal distribution of wealth. So, Marx was saying that to solve problems of misery, poverty, unemployment, high deaths. Uh, you have to transform society from capitalist mode of production to socialist mode of production. And these Marxist thinkers, Marx and uh, Lenin, they also, uh, Angels, Marx, Lenin, they also envisage that, okay, if uh, a socialist society will ever need to control its size, uh, then they can do so and uh, a socialist country will be more effective in uh, uh, regulating population size than a capitalist country. So, that also uh, they said. Uh, 